So if we take the roof off, uh, here is a view of the building plan of our church. Uh, notice the four pillars at each point that carry the main beams. Beams intersect at the center of the, of the church where the altar is located. So the building plan, this design is incorporated in the top of the altar with inlaid wood. It's also the logo that we use uh, for our parish. The cross is formed with inlaid wood on top. The four pillars are inlaid with burl walnut. Uh, now burl wood is caused when the tree experiences some form of stress or wounding. So the risen Christ, of course, still bears the wounds of the crucifixion. And when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord, because they recognized him finally by his wounds in his hand and in his side. So what was meant as a sign of suffering and death is now a sign of glory. We don't forget the past, but through the cross of Christ, we remember the wounds in a new way, as a place of transformation, of beauty, and new life. The legs of the altar repeat the design of the four pillars and the beam uh, forms a cross under the altar. So the altar is actually kind of a miniature of the church. We anoint the altar as the sign of Christ. And of course, Christ is the Greek rendering of Jesus' title. Uh, and the Hebrew of the Greek is Messiah. So it's Jesus Christ in Greek, Joshua, Messiah in Hebrew. And of course, we know that Christ and, or Messiah means the anointed one, so the altar represents Christ. We gather around the altar as Christ who gathers us. That's clear to us. And in our church, the altar is in the very center of the room. But after that, then the cardinal walked around, and we have these anointing stones in the church. You can see the mark of the oil, the cross on the stone. Eight in the big church, four in the little church. We kind of a combination of 12. What does it mean to anoint the walls of the church? The body of Christ gathers within the walls of the church, so we too are the anointed of God. A little reflection here from Susan Palo Sherwin. There's a still point at the center of the cross where all is in harmony, all in balance. It's here at this point where the tensions of the crossings are equal and cannot pull. It's like the wheel of destiny depicted in medieval illuminations. If you place yourself at the rim, you're constantly being pulled down or pushed up. But if you place yourself at the center, at the still point of the turning world, there is calm, there is peace. If you were to walk along the side altars in the typical basilica style of church, you would actually be walking around the cross. You'd be making the stations of the cross on the, the outer rim of the church. And so we use that idea by placing a walking way of the cross on the outer ambulatory of our church. The path is interrupted by the choir. And they're just numbered tiles and kind of reminiscent of the Via Doloroso in Jerusalem. Uh, sometimes it's just a number on the a wall. Here, the fifth station, Simon helps Jesus carry the crosses. Just a numbered tile, no picture. Uh, here is the fourth station, Jesus meets his mother. It's a numbered tile, and then you have this tympanum image of uh, Jesus and his mother. Uh, the Via Doloroso is the path that Jesus took on his way to be crucified. It winds through busy streets, like lined with tourist shops and snack bars, starting in the Muslim quarter near the Lion's Gate. And, where he was tried and convicted and ending where he was crucified and prepared for burial and buried at the location of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the Christian quarter. When you walk this path, there's so much going on and so much chaos, it, it, you really get a sense of what it must have been like because nobody was paying attention of that Friday when Jesus was being led through the busy town streets during the festival of Passover. Uh, I did learn something in, when we were planning the building of the church you know, the sixth station in the traditional set is uh, Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. And that actually, the image, that actually was typical in the Gothic churches. And the word Veronica, it comes from this word, Latin, vera icon, true image. Okay, a little excursus here on liturgical time. There's a crossing here as well. You have the four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. 
The rhythm of the liturgy, though, centers around the summer and the winter solstice and the autumnal and vernal equinox. In the ancient world, if somebody was really important, like a king or somebody, there was a convention that they, how they would talk about how important that person was. And the way that they would say that is that he was so important that he died on the very same day he was born. Now, if you can pull that off, you know, that, you are really somebody, you know. <laughs> and so that was how they say, the, the king died on his birthday, and wow, that's, he was really somebody. So we know that Jesus died, well, you know, we don't know exactly when he was born. We think he was born around the year 4 BC, which is about four years ahead of his time. So we know when Passover was, though, in those years. Uh, so Jesus died either on March 25th or on April the 6th. That much we know. March 25th or April the 6th. What do we celebrate on March 25th? The Annunciation. So we're using the same convention. Jesus died not on the day he was born, but on the day he was conceived. He's not just any important person. He is the Son of God. So his conception, the Annunciation, happened on March 25th, and he was a perfect baby. He was born on December 25th, exactly nine months later. And if that's wrong, then we've got a backup. January 6th, little Christmas to cover April the 6th. Okay, see how, see how we think? And so the winter solstice, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, and the opposite, the summer solstice, a day before, June the 24th, six month and one day, John the Baptist, who comes to prepare the way for the Christ at the light. And the light, of course, comes into the world at the darkest time, at the winter solstice. And John the Baptist is at the summer solstice just when the days begin to decrease. And John said in John 3, 30, he must increase, I must decrease. So uh, March 25th, of course, is the, is the vernal equinox. And so in the autumnal equinox, we celebrate the exaltation of the cross. I already mentioned that, September the 14th. And from that point on, the, the liturgy, uh, it's really in the old calendar, they call that the vestibule of Lent. Already, we're starting to talk about the death of Christ, the end of time as we move uh, toward Advent and the beginning of the church year. The crucified Christ, which is typical, most churches have a, just a uh, Catholic church, we have a corpus typically on the cross, uh, but not always. And we do have, we do have like the Majesta Batio from Barcelona, that's a, that's a Christ in majesty, that's a resurrected Christ, Christ in glory. And sometimes we have just the plain cross, it's more typical of Protestants. But we have all of that in our tradition. And I use the crucified corpus, of course, during Lent. And then it always goes into the church at September 14th, which is the 24th Sunday in ordinary time. And then it goes until Advent. And then this, the resurrected Christ is all through Advent, Christmas, into the ordinary time until Lent. And then it returns uh, at Pentecost, then through the ordinary time up until the 24th Sunday in ordinary time. Then during the Holy Week and Easter, we use uh, this uh, walnut cross. Marilyn, I think you brought this wood from the family farm in southern Indiana. So it's used here on Palm Sunday, and then for Easter, for seven weeks of Easter, so kind of cross of glory, we have the fresh flowers all, all seven weeks to help carry that through the Easter season. You know we have the fire window, the air window, uh, earth, and water. So those are the four elements of the ancient world. Three are in the church, the big church, and the air window is in the little chapel. Each window has a, 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 like a wallpaper pattern of a circle with a cross in it that's fired into the window with uh, gold. It's 24 karat gold. And the idea for that was to give some dimension to the glass at night because when there's no light shining through, they could just be uh, flat. But the, um, this gives you a pattern. It can pick up the light inside the room. One of the interesting things I learned from Elizabeth Devereaux uh, when we were working on the windows that the, the red uh, glass, you cannot tell during the firing if it's going to be red or not. So you only know after it's cooled whether you got enough red. The earth window has a couple of layers in it, and Elizabeth said that Tiffany would sometimes use three layers of glass to get the desired effect that he was looking for. So when I was preaching on these windows, I wanted to preach on them for Trinity Sunday. And I wanted to share this reflection from Teilhard de Chardin, because he had this wonderful quote about fire. And of course, fire, we think of fire as associated with Pentecost, divided tongues of fire came upon the apostles. And Teilhard had this wonderful line. He said, the day will come when after harnessing the ether, the winds, the tides, and gravitation, we shall harness for God the energies of love. And on that day, for the second time in the history of the world, humans 
will have discovered fire. Teilhard had a lot of other good things to say. <laughs> On the water window, take, going back to the very beginning in Genesis 1, 1, the Spirit of God breathed over the waters. Teilhard said, God is as pervasive and perceptible as the atmosphere in which we are bathed. He encompasses us on all sides, like the world itself. Every exhalation that passes through me, envelops me, or captivates me, emanates without any doubt from the heart of God. Like a subtle and essential energy, it transmits the pulsations of God's will. Every element of which I am made up is an overflow from God. Well, then when I got to the earth window, I found this fascinating thing. Teilhard was a Jesuit priest, was a paleontologist, and he was once in the Ordos Desert when it was impossible for him to celebrate Mass. And it was actually on the Feast of uh, the Transfiguration, August the 6th. And so his thoughts turned to the radiation of the Eucharistic presence of Christ through the whole universe. He said, when through the mouth of the priest, the priest says, Hoc est enum corpus meum, this is my body, these words extend beyond the morsel of bread over which they are said, they give birth to the whole mystical body of Christ. The effect of the priestly act extends beyond the consecrated host to the cosmos itself. So that reflection was really the idea then behind the window in the Eucharistic chapel. And Teilhard wrote in his reflection, The Mass of the World, Since once again, Lord, I have neither bread nor wine nor altar, I will raise myself beyond these symbols up to the pure majesty of the real itself. I, your priest, will make the whole earth my altar, and on it will suffer you all the labors and suffering of the world. The air window, in, this, in chapter 2 of Genesis, God uh, forms out of the clay or the dust of the ground, uh, the earth being, and then breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. And there's several names for God in the Old Testament. Elohim, the name Yahweh, breathing out Yahweh. Yahweh. So when we come out of our mother's womb and we breathe out and in, the breath of God, the name of God is on our lips. And when we leave this world and uh, with our last breath, the name of God is on our lips. So God is as close to us as breath itself. Roar says, isn't it wonderful that breath, wind, spirit, and air are precisely nothing and yet everything. We dedicated the new house of the church in October of the year 2000 and we moved into our new home for the first Sunday of Advent in December of that year. We had been planning and building the new church for almost five years and when we began the process we started visiting churches to get ideas, things that worked, things that we might include in our building. From the very beginning of time we humans have been fascinated by the stars and the heavens. We could gaze into the heavens and contemplate the mystery of God far away. The ancients saw in the stars pictures and they gave them names and drew the lines to connect the dots. Eventually, these star charts found their way into the ceilings of our churches. When I visited this church in Camarillo, California and saw the blue sky with stars painted, I thought we could paint the constellation Orion in the ceiling of the Tabernacle Chapel. And so we ordered the boards for that ceiling unfinished and I painted them blue before the builders put them up to form the ceiling. As I began planning the project, I talked to John Lines, a parish member who is an amateur astronomer. I told him of my idea to paint Orion, and John said, well, you know, Orion is only visible in the winter's night from Lake Orion. I thought, if I were going to paint a winter's night, why not paint the stars visible from our church at midnight on Christmas Eve? Although these images of Orion are viewed from the Hubble telescope. At midnight Christmas Eve, 
Orion is directly overhead our church, visible in the southern sky. Looking up to the south, you can see Orion visible in the center of the ceiling. In the year 2000, the planets Saturn and Jupiter were passing by that Christmas Eve, and so they too are charted in the upper right-hand corner of the southern panel. Here is a view to the west. The North Sky has some very familiar images, the Big and Little Dipper, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, are found in the North Sky. The tail of Ursa Minor, you see that bright star, is called Polaris, we call it the North Star. As it turns out, the North Star is directly over the tabernacle in the chapel. And so I painted this star to look like the star of Bethlehem, because as we read in the Gospel of Matthew in the second chapter, the star which they had observed at its rising went ahead of them to Bethlehem, to the place where the Christ was to be found. This star stands as a beacon in the chapel, guiding us to the place where the Christ is to be found in our church. idea was simply to paint the Orion constellation on the ceiling of the Tabernacle Chapel, but when I finished, I felt as if someone else had been guiding this larger picture, for on the ceiling of the Tabernacle Chapel was the star chart for Christmas, the Feast of the Incarnation, the feast that celebrates Christ taking on flesh and living among us, here in this room is the place where we reserve the body of Christ, the place where Christ is at home in the house of the church. The tabernacle was, it was cast during Holy Week. It was sand-casted, 64 inlaid tiles of lapis lazuli. Uh, the tradition says that the Ten Commandments were carved in lapis lazuli. And the inside of the tabernacle is cherry wood, which is the same wood of the altar. On the top, you see this little oculus here? In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was a formless void, the tohu Vabohu, when the darkness swept over the deep and a divine wind breathed over the waters. The circle formed in the four elements windows becomes a globe in the tabernacle chapel. 
And the globe uh, reflects a Hebrew cosmology. God said, let there be a vault through the middle of the waters and divide the waters in two. And so it was, and God made the vault and divide the waters under the vault from the waters above the vault. The North American continent uh, in the upper dome is etched with a flying bird pattern to reflect the sky above. And then the South American panel uh, landmass is etched with a pattern of fish swimming uh, below the water. And then there are stars in the upper dome of the sky reflecting the ceiling of the chapel. When we're at prayer in the main church, we, we can see Walden Road through the windows. And we can see people passing by, and they can see us at prayer. We're all connected. In the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, at the Last Supper, just before the Passion, the prayer that Jesus prays is called a priestly prayer because he prays not for himself, but for the world. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. This prayer continues in us. This is liturgical prayer. It's Christ's prayer, not ours. The church in this world does not exist for its own sake, but as an instrument of salvation for the world. Its function is to save the world, not itself. So in this kind of prayer, we lift up our voices to God, not as a private offering, but in such a way as to give a voice to the earth itself. Now, I'd like to uh, end with a story uh, that happened years ago when I was uh, associate pastor in the early 80s at St. Edith Church in Livonia. Uh, and I used to visit uh, this woman, she was in the hospital all the time, her name was Mary Dowling. And she had, uh, she was on oxygen, she had some kind of respiratory, uh, she was in and out of the hospital. So whenever I would go to see Mary, uh, she would always say, oh, the best thing that ever happened to St. Edith was Father Jim, <laughs> the Father Jim Scheich, you know, the pastor of the church. Now I'm thinking, I'm a pretty good thing that happened to St. Edith, <laughs> but I never came up. <laughs> it was like a broken record. But the best thing about Father Jim was that he started having parish dances again. Now Mary's husband, Ed, was also in and out of the hospital. I would visit him too. So I was sure that Mary's dancing days were long gone. But my ego was in the way, so I didn't ever hear what Mary was telling me. Well, about this time, the parish had been shopping for a new processional cross, and we were auditioning a copper sculpture. This is not a very good picture. This was by a local artist, you know, Suzanne Young. We have money of her work. Uh, the piece was a little bit controversial, however, because it looked a bit industrial. Well, anyway, Mary died, and when I was preparing for her funeral, I noticed that this figure on the cross was in motion, as if Christ was dancing on the cross. And that's when I finally heard what Mary had been trying to tell me all those years. Mary's dancing days were long gone, but the fact that we were dancing was enough for her. Our dancing lifted her up. So I sang the Lord of the Dance at her funeral. And afterward, everyone said, well, now that we understand this risen Christ sculpture, we can never let it go. But they did. They didn't keep it. Well, I met this figure again 29 years ago when I was assigned as pastor of Christ the Redeemer. And there it was on the front of the church. I, I've seen a picture of it on the original uh, school gymnasium. I told the parish community my story about Mary Dowling and they were not all that impressed and, and they didn't really like that piece much either. It does have a home though on our, our present church. It's a kind of a piece, if it can be appreciated, it needs to be appreciated from a distance. And so it's on the wall, I don't know if you've seen it, it's on the Walden Road side. You have to turn and look, so I think that's a good place for it. We'll end with a little reflection, deep peace.